Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome back to another video from Project IOC. Now again, we will be continuing our seerah of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And in episode 9, we will be discussing the private da'wah. In the early days, the da'wah was not a secret da'wah. The better word to use is that it was a private da'wah. Now what is the difference? Secret means nobody knew about it, but private means you kept it to yourself, but it was an open secret. When the Prophet started preaching Islam, rumors spread and people and the people heard about it. This is proven from the fact that Amr ibn Abbas came all the way from Yemen. And of course, we know when he went back to Mecca, the Prophet peace be upon him had said, it's too early, don't accept Islam now. When you hear I am victorious, then come back to me. Because in the early stages, the Prophet peace be upon him only preached privately. He only went to his friends, those whom he trusted. <clears throat> Thus, there could be no prop public opposition. For three years, the Prophet peace be upon him did not preach to the masses. He did not preach to the pilgrims or the visitors of Mecca or even his own relatives whom he thought would not accept Islam. And these include Abu Lahab, Abu Jahal, which were not approached. Now, of course, Abu Lahab and Abu Jahal heard about the new theology that he is being, that he is being preached but they did not do anything to the Prophet peace be upon him because he was, because he peace be upon him was interfering with the trade of Mecca, nor standing and preaching out loud. So why was the da'wah private? There are many reasons. First and foremost, this private da'wah did not result in any confrontation between the Muslims and the Quraysh, no torture, ridicule, etc. Now why? Well, because there was no threat. If someone converted to Islam, he was not making a public announcement. He was simply minding his own business and not getting involved with the society at a religious level. So for these first three years, there was no torture, persecution, etc. The Muslims were being taught their religion, concentrating on the teachings of Islam without having to worry about politics, torture, and more. In fact, this is what prepared them with the spiritual boost they needed to face the torture later on in their lives. This also shows in some circumstances it is permissible to give da'wah in private. If the political climate is one of fear and tension, you don't have to go in public about your da'wah. So the wisdoms of doing that were privately in this early stages were number one, there was no persecution. Number two, it was a stage to allow Iman to build. Number three, allowed the brotherhood between Muslims to form. And number four, each and every one of these converts became a role model and many other blessings along with that. <clears throat> there is no authentic narration, but it seems that at this early stage, Salah and Wudu were legislated. Jibreel salam came down and taught the Prophet peace be upon him how to do Wudu and how to pray. Though at this stage, prayer was voluntarily and not obligatory. It was made obligatory in Al-Isra wal Mi'raj when the five prayers were set. And that is why when Allah told him to pray, he did not need to be taught how to pray because he already knew. Also, in this early stage, all the prayers were only two rakat. This is what Aisha says in the Hadith in Sahih Bukhari. Now, the open preaching. We move on to the second stage of da'wah, which is open preaching. This open preaching took place three years after Iqra came down. Allah revealed a number of verses which commanded the Prophet peace be upon him to preach openly. Two of them are the most important. Surah Al-Hajj verse 
94. Don't hide. Go forth and proclaim what we have commanded you, and turn away from the ignorant people. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, understood this is the, a command to go public. Then a verse came down, which is even more explicit. The verse that is commonly associated with public da'wah, Surah Al-Shu'ara, verse 214. And warn your close relatives. The word Ashira in the ayah not only applies to his uncles and aunts, but also to all of his tribe, tribesmen. Thus, this referred to the Quraysh and all of the people in Mecca who were his kith and kin. And so the Prophet, peace be upon him, realized that he needed to spread this message publicly. Now looking at the sources from the books of Sirah, it appears that he did not, that he did this in two stages. The first stage was that he went public to Bani Hashim only, that is his immediate tribe. Recall, the noble people of Mecca were all Quraysh, so the Prophet peace be upon it invited his immediate tribe. His immediate tribes included uncles and aunts, over 40 of the adults to his own house and told Ali ibn Abu Talib to prepare food and soup. And the narrator says, even though the food is in one plate, all 40 ate to their fill as if they ate from the plate themselves, and they drank the soup to their fill as if they drank from one cup alone. Abu Lahab sensed that something was going to happen. He was scared that the Prophet peace be upon him would make public what was now private. So before they finished eating, Abu Lahab made an excuse. He said he needed to leave. Of course he was a senior, so when he left it destroyed the aura that was being created. So a number of others also left alongside him. The Prophet peace be upon him understood that this was a tactic of Abu Lahab. So a few days later, the Prophet peace be upon him did the same thing. He told Ali to make another meal, invited them again. And this time, before they could finish, he stood up and began preaching. He began by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and giving khutbah, khutbah al-hajah. And then said, O Bani Abdul Muttalib, I do not know of any Arab before me who is coming to his people with a message that is better than what I am coming to you with. I am coming to you with something that will give you your deen and your dunya, the world and the akhirah. I am coming as a messenger from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if you leave your idolatry and turn to him, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you all the good of this world and give you the jannah in the next. And he went on preaching and preaching. Before this time, they might have heard the Prophet, peace be upon him, was preaching. But they had never been approached directly. This was the first time the message of Al-Islam openly reached many of their ears. Abu Lahab became irritated and said to the people around the Prophet, peace be upon him, This seems to be an unworthy message. We have our own own way of following our forefathers. Who does this young man think he is coming and opposes the way of our forefathers? Abu Lahab was the only one that was harsh. The rest of his uncles and aunts didn't take the message that seriously. And in one of the source books, it is said that Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu stood up and said, O Messenger of Allah, I will help you. And of course, there is no surprise in Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu being this brave. At this point, his immediate relatives did not accept nor reject. So moving on to the second stage. <clears throat> A few days or weeks later, soon after this, the Prophet peace be upon him went public to the whole city of Mecca, reported in the sound collection of Bukhari, the Prophet peace be upon him climbed the Mount of Safa, which was the closest mountain to the Kaaba. It was much taller than it is now, so for a person in Mecca to climb to the top of Safa, this was equivalent of, I have an announcement to make. So the Prophet peace be upon him climbed all the way to the top of Safa and he began calling the people. We have to realize Mecca only had around a thousand people 
a small little village. So when the prefect, prophet peace be upon him was calling all the tribes, everyone came. People stopped doing what they were doing and they came and listened. The prophet peace be upon him waited for everyone to assemble. And then he said, if I were to inform you about something, do you trust me? And they said, we know nothing but good from you. You are our son and this son of our brother, you are our nephew. Have you heard any lie from me? We have heard nothing but good. You are Al Amin. And then the Prophet peace be upon him said, If I were to tell you that there is an army coming to attack, would you believe me? Without any checking, just my word. And they said, Yes, we never heard you ever say a lie. So this is when the Prophet peace be upon him said, Then no. Therefore, I am a warner sent by Allah to proclaim the message of a severe punishment on the Day of Judgment unless you turn to Allah and leave your ideology. O tribe of Kaab ibn Lu'ah, save yourselves from the fire of hell. I will not be able to help you. O Bani Murah ibn Kaab, save yourselves from the fire of hell. I will not be able to help you. O Bani Abd Manaf, O Bani Abdul Muttalib, so on and so forth. He began with the furthest tribes that was related to him and worked his way inwards closer to closer until he got to Bani Hashim. And then he began mentioning his uncles and his aunts by name. O Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, O Safiya bin Abdul Muttalib, etc. And he concluded with the person who was the most dear and the most beloved to him, O Fatima bint Muhammad, you need to save yourself from the fire of hell. I will not be able to help you on the, on the day of judgment. And with Fatima, he, peace be upon him, added one phrase, except that in this world, I will give you all that I have. I am your father. You ask me anything that I have, it is yours. But in the hereafter, I cannot save you from the punishment of Allah. When the Prophet peace be upon him finished this very emotional message, this is when Abu Lahab stood up, picked up some sand and threw it in the direction of the Prophet peace be upon him. And this is meant to show vulgarity. And say, what is this message? It's not even worth this sand I am throwing. It's a sign of great arrogance. Then he said, may you be cursed, O Muhammad. Is this why you called us here? And this is when Allah revealed the Quran, Surah Al-Masad. Yes. So Abu Lahab was the first person to publicly oppose and ridicule this message. In the house of the Prophet, peace be upon him, a few days ago, he was not that rude. But now, in public, because of his own arrogance and rudeness, he publicly opposed the Prophet, peace be upon him, in a quite vulgar manner. And thus, Allah revealed Surah Al-Masad. This is of course the Sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never has a messenger been sent except that he has had to face struggles and hardships against his own people. Most of mankind do not want to change their lifestyle. It's difficult to give up what you are used to. It's difficult to lead a religious life. And for those of you that may not know, Surah Al-Masad talks about the punishment of both Abu Lahab and his wife in the hereafter. Now let's discuss some of the wisdoms that we learned from the Prophet's peace be upon him's da'wah so far. So one of the benefits we gain here is that every single person needs to be responsible first and foremost for his immediate family and then for society at large. Indeed, initially the Prophet peace be upon him is told to preach to his own relatives so much that when a Yemeni came to him, he tells him, not now. So the responsibility of a da'i is much more for his immediate family than anyone else. Indeed, the Prophet peace be upon him first called Banu Hashim, when the people of Mecca. From this point onwards, the Prophet peace be upon him started preaching everywhere, in public venues, in front of the Kaaba, when visitors Hujjaj came to Mecca, the Prophet peace be upon him would speak to them in the marketplaces of Mina. This is when the da'wah became public. 
And of course, this is when the public opposition began as well. Oppositions from the Quraysh. How did the people oppose the message? By many ways. Note, these aren't necessarily chronological. Number one, appealing to the highest authority. The first thing is that they tried to appeal to the highest authority, which was Abu Talib. Recall, there was no one ruler in Mecca. They were too arrogant to appoint one ruler. What did they have? What did they have was Dar, Dar al Nadwa, a group of senior people, none of whom were in charge, but had to, but had a big say in matters of the community. Who were these people? Well, they were the representatives of each of the sub tribes of Mecca. So each of the sub tribes had a ruler. The Banu Hashim had a ruler. The Banu Makhzum had a ruler, and the Banu Abdul Dar. He had a ruler. The affairs of that one tribe would be in accordance with what each chieftain says. The leader of Banu Hashim was of course Abu Talib. It's the way of the Arabs that the leader of each tribe is never deposed, never gotten rid of, never disobeyed, etc. He is given the utmost respect and then when he dies, one of his sons takes over. Just like when Abdul Muttalib died, Abu Talib took over. So when the Prophet peace be upon him started preaching, they went to Abu Talib gently and said, O oh Abu Talib, this is your nephew cursing our idols, preaching a new message. Surely you cannot let this happen. Abu Talib did not want confrontation. He gave them some gentle words and let them go their way. He simply sidetracked, hoping that the matter would go away, but it didn't. A few weeks later, they came to Abu Talib again. As more and more people converted to Islam, as more and more of the Hujjaj went back bearing the news that there is a man in Mecca preaching a new message, they realized that actions had to be taken. So they increased the pressure of Abu Talib. They tried, a, they tried to threaten, bribe, and persuade him. We cannot take this anymore. Your nephew is insulting our forefathers. This is the way of everybody who opposes Islam, even in our time. They take a small thing and make it so big as if the world is going to collapse. The Prophet peace be upon him never cursed their forefathers. They are his own forefathers. He peace, be, he peace be upon him was preaching Tawheed. But they turned a statement like ideology is not a good way. It's foolish and exaggerated in 20 times by saying, well, if it's foolish, this means our forefathers were foolish. And if they were foolish, this means you are coercing them. And of their accusations was, your nephew is cursing our idols. But the Prophet, peace be upon him, never cursed the idols. As Allah says, and do not cur curse those they invoke other than Allah, lest they insult Allah in enmity without knowledge. In Quran, and yet, they accused of cursing their idols. So they went back to Abu Talib and told him, Your nephew is doing this and that. We cannot bear this anymore. You stop him from preaching or your hand over to us and we do as we please. And Abu Talib had never been confronted by his people in this manner ever before. So we find that Abu Talib never experienced anything like this. Once again, they could not harm their own tribesmen unless the chief allowed it. This is the laws of the Arabs. If they did not obey, they would face shame and ridicule. So as long as Abu Talib did not hand over the Prophet peace be upon him, they could not do anything. So they went to Abu Talib and demanded one of those two things. This is when Abu Talib went to the Prophet peace be upon him and said, O oh my nephew, my people have come to me and said such and such. So be merciful for yourself and be merciful to me. Do not place me in a situation I cannot bear. This was emotional blackmail at its best. This was of course the most difficult encounters for the Prophet peace be upon him. Abu Talib loved the Prophet peace be upon him so much, more than his own children. And remember, Abu Talib was the Prophet peace be upon him's real blood uncle. And the Prophet peace be upon him had the same type of love for Abu Talib like a father. And here, Abu Talib 
is begging and pleading with the Prophet peace be upon him that have some mercy on me. I am an old man. How much can I bear? This is when the Prophet peace be upon him re replied, O oh my uncle, Wallahi, if they were to give me the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand, I cannot give up this message until I succeed in what I am doing, or I die a death in this path, preaching what I am preaching. When Abu Talib saw this persistence and sincerity, he said, Do what you will, my nephew. I will never come to you again to stop you. You have my full protection. So the second opposition from the Quraysh was proposing a treacherous bargain to Abu Talib. When the people heard that Abu Talib tried to stop the Prophet peace be upon him and failed, they went back to Abu Talib, but this time with the whole delegation of Quraysh. So not just Banu Hashim, but all of the tribes. This was the stepping stone. The next step, of course, was the boycott, which we will talk about in a later episode. So for now, they said to him, we have a proposition. We have chosen the most noble young man, the son of Al-Walid ibn Al-Mughira, and one son for one son. We'll hand over Al-Umaira ibn Al-Walid to you, and he will become yours, meaning your son. And in return, you hand over your nephew to us, and we do as we please. At this time, Abu Talib became very angry and said, What an evil, treacherous bargain. What kind of foolish bargain is this? You want me to take care of one of your own so that I fatten him with my food while you take my son and kill him? At this, Mut'im ibn Abd stood up and said, O oh Abu Talib, I think your people have done as much as they humanly can. You must accept one of their offers. Mut'im ibn Abd was the senior most person in all of Mecca. Re recall, he was the one that prevented the bloodshed in the Kaaba by suggesting the solution to the black stone. This is the least hostile person that has the most sense. So for him to take sides, this was a big deal. Now it's literally the whole of Mecca against Abu Talib. Mut'im said, what more do you expect them to do? So Abu Talib showed bravery that is unbelievable. He said to him directly, O oh Mut'im, this is a plot that you have hatched to stand up at this time and publicly take sides. You had this plan from before. Then he says, do as you please. I will not budge from my position. This was a genuine bravery. He had no support whatsoever. He was literally his honor and prestige against the whole of Quraysh. Abu Talib also wrote some poetry. Note that Abu Talib was one of the greatest poets of the Quraysh, and this poetry was absolutely phenomenal. In fact, Ibn Hajar and many others say that his poetry was more profound and even better than the Mu'alaqat, seven hanging poems in the Kaaba. His poetry is recorded in many books. Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hisham, Ibn Hisham, the Tabaqat of Ibn Sa'd, and so he composed a series of poems chastising his own relatives and accusing them of being traitors to their own way of lives. That they are not respecting the sanctity of their own relatives, and Allah willed that the Quraysh back down even though Abu Talib had literally no power on his side but it was the sense of dignity and sincerity and the strength of conviction that allowed him to prosper. In this one incident, we open up the window to see the wisdoms of Abu Talib. Indeed, the Prophet peace be upon him did not love anyone more than Abu Talib, and yet Abu Talib did not convert to Islam. The Prophet peace be upon him begged and pleaded with him, even on his beth deathbed, when the Prophet peace be upon him was 50 to 51 years old, in the later stages of the Sirah. To which he said, O oh my uncle, I beg you, 
Say la ilaha illallah so that I will be able to argue in front of you to Allah that he saves you. And Abu Talib was about to say it because in his heart he knew that the message of the Prophet peace be upon him is true. He had seen too many signs and miracles and he knew the Prophet peace be upon him too well that he could not tell a lie. Because there was, no, because there was one thing more precious than his nephew and that was his father, that lineage and prestige. You are the son of Abdul Muttalib, that prestigious that prestige of lineage, which was everything for the Arabs, is what prevented Abu Talib. He happened to be the son of the most famous Arabs of the generation, this giant of a figure. Abu Talib was just about to say the kalima, but Abu Jahl was standing there and said, Are you going to leave the religion of your father that caused the mouth of Abu Talib to close? And that's when he said, and that's when the Malak, that's when the Malak al Maut came to him and took out his soul. He did not say the kalima. But the Prophet, peace be upon him, was so emotionally moved, he said, I will ask Allah to forgive you even if I don't have permission. And so the Prophet, peace be upon him, continued to ask for forgiveness without permission for his uncle until Allah revealed multiple verses in the Quran. One such is, it's not befitting for the Prophet and the believers to seek forgiveness for pagans even if they are close relatives. And another one of them is, you are not able to guide those whom you love, but Allah guides those whom He pleases. So Abu Talib was the most beloved person to the Prophet peace be upon him, the one whom he loved like no one else. So much so that many years later when the Muslims conquered Mecca, Abu Bakr came to the Prophet peace be upon him with his own father, Abu Kuhafa, a pagan and an enemy to Islam, being carried by the people to finally accept Islam as an old man of 80 years old. When Abu Kuhafa put his hands on the Prophet peace be upon him, hand and recited the kalima, Abu Bakr began to cry and said, Wallahi, what I would give even my father's hand if I could see the hand of Abu Talib in your hand to accept Islam. Abu Bakr would even give up his own father's Islam because he wanted the Islam of Abu Talib showing he knew how much the Prophet peace be upon him loved Abu Talib. Yet Allah did not allow him to die in Islam. So why? What are some of the wisdoms behind this? Well, firstly, we see the wisdom because the one person who could have protected him had to remain a pagan. If Abu Talib had converted, he would have lost the leadership, the status, and the protection he could have offered to the Prophet, peace be upon him. So Allah knows best. Allah knows better than even the Prophet, peace be upon him. The Prophet, peace be upon him, needed Abu Talib. And his one claim to power and fame was that he was the son of Abdul Muttalib. So nobody could oppose him. And because of that power, the Prophet peace be upon him could preach as he preached. It was only after the death of Abu Talib when Abu Lahab took charge that the Prophet peace be upon him had to leave Mecca. So the second wisdom is that nobody can dictate to Allah, not even the Prophet peace be upon him. As Allah says in the Quran, you are not able to guide those whom you love, but Allah guides those whom he pleases. This is a clear indication that the Prophet peace be upon him is just a human. He is not God. He is not a demigod, nor is he the son of a god. He does not control the lives of anyone including his own uncle. Even in his first khutbah, the Prophet peace be upon him told his own daughter that he won't be able to protect her from the hellfire. So the last topic that we're going to discuss in this episode are the different statuses of the four direct uncles of the Prophet peace be upon him. Notice as well, we see the four uncles of the Prophet peace be upon him. All of them children of Abdul Muttalib. Each of them occupy such a different level. All of them direct uncles. Showing us how lineage means nothing in Islam. It is your own actions that matter. To Muslims, to non-Muslims. 
The highest of them is Hamza, the Sayyid al-Shuhada, leader of the martyrs. The second is Abbas, the father of Abdullah ibn Abbas, a great Muslim who converted later on, but he cannot be compared to Hamza or the ten elites. The third is Abu Talib, the highest person ever amongst the non-Muslims in the history of our religion. No non-Muslim occupies a rank higher than him. And any hadith in Sahih Muslim, Al-Abbas asked the Prophet, peace be upon him, O Messenger of Allah, your uncle benefited you so much. Weren't you able to benefit him back? And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Yes, I did. Because of my dua for him, that Abu Talib has been removed to one of the outlying perimeters of the fire of hell. Where it is not from my dua, he would be in the pits and the depths of the fire of hell. In another version, we read that Abu Talib has the least punishment out of all the people of Jahannam. No one in Jahannam is being punished lesser than Abu Talib. But he did not get to Jannah because he is an idol worshipper. Now the last one is Abu Lahab, for whom Allah revealed a surah that we recite in the Qur'an that curses him till the day of judgment. The only enemy of Islam at the time who is cursed by name in Qur'an. There are many indirect references without name, but the only one referenced by name is the uncle of the Prophet peace be upon him, Abu Lahab. We recite the surah until the day of judgment invoking the curse upon him for what he had done. These are four brothers and every one of them occupies such a different level even though they are all sons of the same father and they are all uncles of the greatest human being who ever walked the face of the earth. This shows that your fathers and children will not help you on the day of judgment. Rather, it is what each and every one of us have done in this world. This is the basic message of the Prophet, peace be upon him, said in his first khutbah. Nobody can help you against the punishment of Allah. You must save yourself. Therefore, live righteous lives. Thank you so much for watching this video. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.